and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Alexei, and today I have a special guest, Joe Carroll. Joe Carroll is a professional sound engineer from Nashville, Tennessee, who has 11 Grammy-nominated albums, 33 charted number ones, and Billboard Top 10s. It's a huge honor to have you on my YouTube channel. Also, you can check out In The Mix with Joe Carroll series on YouTube, a link will be in the info box of this video. And let's start our interview. And my first question is how you became a sound engineer? Uh, well, I, pretty much a lifelong musician. Uh, so it kind of happened really naturally uh, from a very, very early age. Uh, I, I have very vivid memories of being um, um, very interested in sound, you know, noticing various things about records and 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 thinking a lot about that as opposed to just just you know the the musicianship parts uh but the very first time as a drummer uh that i went into a studio to record i fell in love with the atmosphere and all the blinking lights and the, the reels of tape moving and i mean you name it and i never wanted to leave so um i i, I put together my own home studio as i could afford it because i i i was very uh very not rich <laughs> and um you know would get things like a little 16 channel uh mackie mixer back in the 90s um i could uh at one point i could finally afford my first eight channels of adat if you remember the alesis the tape-based digital system uh got one of those you know just really really meager outboard stuff like a alesis midi verbs and micro verbs and various things and um it was um you know, it was uh, a meager start, but but it was but it was great because you, you you can learn a lot at your own pace, and uh, all of that led me to an opportunity where one day, as as a drummer, um, the piano player on a on a job mentioned that she was going to be part of a big studio build operation, and uh, you know she started throwing out words like Pro Tools, and this course Pro Tools was very you know young at the time; it wasn't what it is now. And, um, but, you know, I was an avid reader of mix magazine and EQ magazine and whatnot. And all, all that was just like, yeah, I heard that, those terms and I was like, man, I, I need to work there. <laughs> so I went and interviewed for the job and it was basically to be an assistant for a Nashville, you know, an established Nashville guy. And, um, at the, you know, during our discussion at the end of it, he kind of said, um, um, he said, you know, you're, really not qualified for this job. And you probably know that he said, but you're so hungry and passionate. I can't not give you the job. And so, um, the, you know, the rest is history. I got into the studio assisting, uh, Bobby Bradley, uh, which is a, you know, his family is a Nashville legend. Uh, his uncle Owen was, you know, kind of the creator of, of music row, you know? Um, so it's, it's a, it was a great, you know, it was a great system to come up in and I'm very thankful and very grateful for it. What is your opinion on analog versus digital sound? Well, that's a good question. I I, I love them both. I, I mean, I, by nature, I tend to prefer analog. Uh, I love the sound of tubes. I love the sound of transients. I even love the sound of, of what a tape machine does, even though I've only used analog tape probably one time in the last five years. Um, I use a lot of simulations of it, you know, in the box mixing. But but that said, digital has its place too. Uh, you know, like there's certain songs that you mix that need to, they it doesn't need to be rounded. It needs to be very sharp and very precise. Uh, hip hop, for example, a lot of times, if it's not relying on loops to, that sound vintage and retro, um, it needs to sound fairly sharp. And you know, digital can do something that uh, analog never could in that way. So um, I, I, I feel like we're, we're kind of in a best of both world situations right now, even in our digital tools like Pro Tools or whatever DAW your, um, your audience uses, we can create very uh, analog sounding mixes, you know, um, within that world. So I, I, I'm pretty excited about where we're at. But, you know, if I had to pick one, preferably, it, it would be analog. What analog gear do you usually use for tracking instruments? Uh, that's a good question. Um, be because of coming up in Nashville, you know, as an independent, the way that I did, you go to a lot of different studios and record. Uh, um, so you kind of develop a habit of using whatever is there. I mean, whatever we have to make work, we will make work. Uh, you know, I don't care what the case may be. We just we have to get something captured and onto, you know, tape or Pro Tools or whatever the case may be. 
But if if you're asking, you know, and I think you are, if I had my, you know, my preferences, if I could pick anything that I wanted um, for drums in large part, I love Neve circuits. Uh, I, I love, um, you know, like a 1073, you know, style preamp and, and EQ on drums. I like the kick drum and the snare drum. Uh, if I can get them on uh, Tom Toms and overheads, I, I, I love that. But I am just as much uh, in love with API circuits. So um, I, I will use API a lot on other things because they're um, faster. You know, like 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 for example, a snare drum uh, and a kick drum. I love what that a neat a neve is big sounding, right? It's kind of fluffy and puffy and warm. And so elements in a mix that take up a lot of room: kick drum, snare drum, uh, bass guitar, lead vocal. I, I will tend tend to push those to neves because those are elements that take up a lot of room in our mix anyway. And so I'll supplement that with all the other elements that, that uh, I, I, I say they hold hands nice. Uh, so you've got guitars, uh, pianos, um, you know, maybe the drum ambience, uh, um, loops, you know, just on and on, uh, um, electric guitars, acoustic guitars, mandolin, fiddle, uh, that all kind of happen in the same frequency range, if that makes sense. Um, and they're providing kind of the same role as opposed to where drums are more punchy and transient rich. Uh, those things sustain, right. And create the chords that's, you know, underneath our punchy elements and our vocal. So that said, things like API, because they're very lean and not as puffy, uh, very, they're tight sounding. I will use, I will tend to rely on though on APIs and various circuits like that uh, on those other elements that that I need to just stack up and 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 do their job without taking up a lot of space. It, I hope that makes sense. So um, in, in, in that regard, I'm kind of thinking about the mix while I'm tracking because the things that I record through a Neve will in, they're invariably because of the nature of that circuit going to push their way to the front because they're big sounding. That's the way. That's just the way that circuit sounds. Whereas you know, electric guitars and things like that will naturally, um, because it's a leaner, tighter sound, will hold hands behind those elements. Um, and, and so I like, you know, th that's kind of my preference. But I love to work in other things like, um, you know, the Rupert Neve Amec 9098 uh, circuits. I have some of those in my own personal rack. Uh, Avalon 737, you know, on vocals is a, is a, is a great, you know, tube option to the Neve. Um, so th those are some of my favorites, you know, personal preamps. Do you use drum samples to make drums sound huge in the mix? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I think if you don't nowadays, you're, 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 you're almost, um, cutting yourself out of work, uh, because everybody else is doing it. So if you want your drums to sound big and impressive as mixer A, B and C, uh, you, you pretty much have to do it. Now it's genre specific. I would not do that in every genre. Uh, um, I, I'm fortunate enough to work in a lot of genres and for example, in jazz and some blues, for example, um, Broadway style music. Um, I would never do sample enhance. I, if I, you know, if there was something wrong with the recording and I had to, you know, change the, the bass drum or something like that, I would, but, um, I'm not going to, um, you know, I'm not going to, you know, if, if, if I don't have to, but on other modern styles of music, like rock and, and the modern country sound pop, if you don't use samples, I feel like your drums are going to, you know, just, they're not going to be as impressive as the next guys. Uh, I think the art now that everybody's doing it and it's kind of the standard, the art is finding the balance between the real drums and the samples to where it still sounds, you know, sometimes, the mix, it almost sounds better if it's a little pro, even though it's a live drummer, if it's a little programmy. So you'll use a little bit more of the sample. Uh, whereas on some songs, it needs to be very natural sounding. It still sound needs to sound like a real drummer. And you almost need to a little bit hide the fact that there's samples going on. You know, it's not supposed to be apparent that, hey, this is a fake snare drum. Um, so we'll have the the real snare drum louder and bring in whatever kind of sample we need to create whatever's missing. Maybe we need more uh, attack. Maybe we need more of a ringy, boing sound. Maybe we need more body, you know, that goosh kind of thing that the real snare drum isn't giving us. 
So I'll use just enough of that to fill it out. But I feel like you have to use samples nowadays in a lot of forms of music to be competitive. So where and when and how often should you use power compression? Uh, that's a good question. I, I definitely think, again, it's kind of genre specific. But what I'm doing with parallel compression is all, very rarely am I affecting the transient. I'm not trying to get more attack. Um, um, usually the way I use it, whether it's on vocals, uh, drums, or uh, other instruments, is to create sustain and, and size. So if I need, um, you know, anytime I need that sustain and size, I'm going to use parallel compression on drums. I love uh, 1176s, for example. Um, I, I've got, you know, I just think the the release is very explosive. So since I'm trying to, again, I'm trying to create sustain, I can make the snare drum ring longer. I can make the tom-toms ring longer um, and sound bigger, even without samples. Um, the, you know, so so that's how I use it on on drums. And uh, on vocals, it, I, 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 I'm generally trying to reduce dynamic range, so I don't want transients to pop. So usually I'm using a very fast attack and, and a faster release as well uh, on the parallel track. So I'm getting a real super consistent, you know, on its own bad sounding vocal. But when I blend that up underneath the more dynamic vocal, um, and I will even do that, um, Alexi, I will even do that sometimes on Broadway and jazz styles of music um, just to get more... Um, uh, emotion out of the softer parts of the words, you know, as they release the word at the end of a word, sometimes that's where the most, um, you know, the most cry, you know, the most, uh, sex appeal, you know, like whatever we want to say, uh, is at the very end of the words and that parallel compression will lift that. So that's kind of not genre specific for me. Um, it just depends on how much dynamic range I need. And then, uh, lastly on the instruments themselves, like guitars and keyboards and stuff, um, that's kind of a song by song basis for me. Um, sometimes you don't want the, I'm trying to think of how to say it. Sometimes you don't want the sustain because you need the punch of the electric guitars or the acoustic guitars to be separate from the sustain, right? You've already, you've already got it sounding really great with whatever compressors and EQs and things you're using uh, actually on the channels. So sometimes parallel compression on that turns it into mud. And other times, other times, um, you know, that that is what keep is keeping everything in check. You know, in some forms of music that that uh, have a lot of uh, instrumentation that's playing melodic fills, like if it's a like in country music, for example, in Nashville, we have fiddle, steel guitar, electric guitars and pianos that are playing uh, lines that answer the vocals. So you probably know what I'm talking about. And that will um, parallel compression has a way of making those things. You can turn them up in the mix but then that parallel compression kind of turns it down in a way, you know, where the volume is still up, but it just sounds more consistent and and allows what it does to the other instruments is what's important. The things that aren't being featured at that moment kind of kind of um, tuck a little bit to where that that melodic moment can be more apparent. So it's a for me, it's a very song by song basis, uh, you know, on on instruments, uh, you know, as far as not drums or vocals you know it's um just always going to be different every day is different well, i'd like to ask a uh, uh, next question about nashville because now i'm watching your series in the mix and uh, i have never been to america but i know that nashville is all about country music and since nashville is all about country music and you are one of the top sound engineers in Nashville. So how do you survive in Nashville? Um, well, that's that's a great question. And and, and it starts with the misperception uh, that, that Nashville is all about country music. It was. You know, when we look back at the 60s and the 70s, you're right. That's what that's what Nashville was. But now Nashville is really the new it, I I feel like most anybody you ask will would agree with me that Nashville is what L, you know Los Angeles was uh 20, 30 years ago. Uh, now we are the live hotbed of the most talented studio musicians, you know, uh, studios all over the, you know, great studios around town. Uh, we're talking about orchestras as well. We're doing more and more movies and films and gaming. And I, I work in or orchestral uh, quite a bit as well. Um, so we do 
in that we're just as likely to go to the studio one day and work on a pop track or a rock track or a jazz track as we are a country track now. Um, so it, Nashville is a very different environment than, you know, the way it's portrayed sometimes on TV or in memories of what it used to be. Uh, now it's, you know, it, it's the hotbed of everything. Um, so, but how do you survive in Nashville? Um, that's a great question. I think, I mean, obviously the quality of the work has to speak for itself, but in addition to that, I feel like you have to be an extremely likable, personable person, uh, because the, so much talent has moved there from all over the country. Uh, it, they're, they've left Los Angeles by droves to come to Nashville because that's where it's hot now. So there's so many choices of engineers, mixers, guitar players, keyboard players, that if they don't like you, they don't hire you. So you, you pretty much have to be a very friendly, likable person uh, to, to keep your foot in the door. Um, and that goes with other things like being on time you know, like never be late. Like if you're, if you're, you, you always want to be early. Um, um, just dedication. You never mix a, you never miss a deadline. So for example, if I'm working on a, on an album, uh, yesterday is a perfect example that it's like, they need, they, they wanted it to be in mastering, sent to mastering last night by the end of the day. So I, I put in a very, very long day yesterday doing all the producers, little final edits and tweaks, you know, Hey, turn this vocal up just a little bit, you know, a little less reverb on this instrument, uh, hours and hours and hours and printed all of that. So I could have it to mastering, you know, so that mastering engineer, when he wakes up this morning in New York city, it's there waiting on him. So you have to meet all of those deadlines. It's a bunch of little, just good business practices, common sense business practices that if you take care of those and you're likable and you're talented and skilled at the same time, I think the rest of it takes care of itself. Once you get your foot in the door or now getting your foot in the door is a whole different story. That's the hard part, you know, or, or one of the hard parts. But once you get your foot in the door, if you're likable and you're talented, it seems like everything else just kind of takes it takes care of itself. What tips or tricks can you give on using volume automation in the mix? That's a good question. I, I'm a... I'm very big on automation. Uh, that's the way I learned. The guy, you know, that I came up under, um, you know, that was his whole approach. I had um, I, the very first time I saw him mix a song, I was blown away because I was used to static levels on on you know uh, Mackies, right? Like as we was talking about earlier, you just get everything sounded good, and maybe you know while you're printing it at, the, at your final mix, while you're printing it, you goose some faders here and there, you make yourself some little notes. You know, it's like, hey, here's the guitar solo. I'll turn the guitar solo up momentarily. But he he spent hours doing this kind of stuff, word by word, with a with a, a lyric sheet. You know, making little arrows and then erasing it and making new arrows, telling him to turn it up or turn it down. And I was blown away. So that is a part of my now. That's a part of my everyday system. I, I feel like if I'm not moving faders or using a mouth to to do all of this you know, on every instrument, practically, I mean, every instrument, um, then the mix isn't going to be as exciting as it should be. You know, I, that's one of the problems I hear sometimes with other people's work. If they ask me to look into it for them and I, you know, it's, um, I can say, Hey, everything is great. Your balances are great, but it's just laying there like this, you know, get your hand on some faders and put, you know, force, force excitement into it that the listener can engage with. And all of a sudden it's a whole different song. Um, as far as tips, um, I like to start once I get everything sounding great, Alexi, I like to start, I like to mute the vocals and focus on just the band. And, and I go section by section and I and turn, you know, adjusting and, and until it feels right. And, you know, I build uh, dynamics from section to section. Maybe here's the verse, right? On the chorus, here comes the level. And then we drop back down for the verse. Here's a chorus. Okay, now the bridge in this particular arrangement is the biggest part of the song. We go up even a little bit more. You know, maybe a, a whole new section of instrumentation kicks in so the song gets even bigger. Okay, so now after I've established, hey, the track feels great now. It's exciting. It's building in intensity, coming back down when it needs to. Um, now I can put the vocal back in and mix the vocal to where I know it's going to be at the per perfect level to be just on top of the track at all times. So that that's a little workflow secret for me that helps me to keep the vocal uh, always where it needs to be. Because since it is the most important part, I actually automate it last. And that's how I know it, it needs to be right all the time. So now that I have all this other stuff right, 
I do the vocal last and I know it's going to be right because everything, I'm not going to turn anything else up after the fact the vocal can be keen. So my next question is about recording and, and mixing at the same time. Can you record, for, for instance, a band right now by using your SSL console and mixing at the same time? Okay, that's a great question. To answer your question, yes, you could. But do I or would I? No, because I'm always going to want to go back into the mix and make it better than what I did in one real time pass. Uh, but but now this is a biggie. Um, and this is like one of the secrets to like, like the way Al Schmidt used to work and the way that I came up working um, with. If you're using outboard preamps like the room that you see me in in Nashville, for example, a lot, uh, everything's outboard preamps. So, uh, and that's a situation in a lot of rooms, uh, you know, less and less rooms actually have big consoles. So you get it on tape, you know, and then you have to mix it because all your automation, all your, I'm going to turn this up. I'm going to turn this down. Uh, it, it, none of that's in place. So the only time you can do that is after the fact. But when we were working on big analog desks, uh, you know, now not the duality doesn't have this, but all the other versions of SSL and most all Neves and everything else have a two tape level, you know, wh whether it's a pot or a fader and then a return, you probably know what I'm talking about. So we had two, you know, inline consoles had two, um, excuse me, uh, two faders and per channel. And so what we would do is we would, um, Bobby taught me to, as we were recording, he would kind of make mental notes about the song, you know, time code locations. Cause this was before pro tools. And, um, Okay, here's where a verse hits, here's a chorus hits, Th this part is really loud, this part is soft, hey, it's going to be an electric solo starting at time code location, whatever the case may be. And he, he would ride the two tape faders. So what's being recorded to tape or digital hard drive, whatever the case may be, he was automating uh, to some degree as he went. So, of course, I, I, I started doing that myself. I would, I would record a session with all of those faders in, in a rough mix position. To where if, you know, I brought it back up months later on a console and put all the faders at Unity, it would still sound like my bl my starting blend, if that makes sense. Um, and, and then little things like um, if I keep a, a, a preamp next to me, if it's not a stepped preamp, if it's got a variable, you know, a, a fully adjustable gain output knob, um, I will ride the gain on the input or the output as as in lieu of my fader to achieve a more consistent vocal that's going to tape already more mixed sounding. Now, even though I'm doing all of that, if when I can, um, I'm still going to do a separate mix process because I know I can make it better than what I could. I mean, basically, if if you do it all, if you're relying on the time that they're recording you know, to be your complete mix job. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like being a live mixer in a, in a club. It's like you get one shot and you're done and I'm never going to be happy with my one shot. I'm always going to want to go back in and, and reassess and readdress and make things better. And I think that's one of the great things about working in a studio versus being a, a live sound guy. If I want to spend eight hours perfecting something to, it, to make my own heart happy, I can, you know, I get more than one shot. Uh, but but yeah, but if you if you have an analog desk with a, a return path and a send path, uh, or you can get your hands on some output knobs on preamps, you can indeed print a more mixed uh, version of your multi tracks uh, right from the beginning. So my next question is, what is the definition of a good mix for you? Uh, you know what? That's a great question, and it has nothing to do with a certain sonic sound. It has everything to do with how that sound affects the song. So when you listen to, you know, various genres and even within the same genre, if we turn on like pop for, you know, top 40 pop radio at this moment, but from song to song, things can really change, right? Like this one has this much high frequency content. This one sounds dark. This one sounds super clean. Now this one sounds kind of like grungy and dirty. None of those are right. And none of those are wrong, but if they match that song to me, they're right. Like I, I can mix sometimes songs that, I basically add no high end EQ whatsoever. You know, it's just, it needs to be dark. And, and like, all I'm doing is, you know, carving away some overlapping lower mids and maybe adding a little bit of uh, personality with some upper mids, but maybe I'm hardly doing any uh, high, high end additions. In fact, I may be even 
low pass filtering, uh, uh, rolling out high end because I need it to be dark and moody. And then there's other songs where, man, it's punchy and in your face all the time. And the first thing you do is start grabbing the high frequency knob and, and start really making it bright or put, you know, like a pull tech or something on the stereo bus to give you a couple dB of air uh, lift because that's what it needs. It needs that excitement and that sizzle. Uh, sometimes it needs to be very clean, uh, you know, like Broadway and, and jazz, you know, for example. And there's uh, other times where it's supposed to sound you know, vintage and dirty and grimy, you know, and that's part of the attitude is that it's almost a little distorted. Uh, so there's not a perfect sound for me. It's a song by song basis. And if what I do EQ wise or aggression wise with compression or distortion, um, if it fits that song and enhances the mood of it to where it's more interesting to the listener, then I feel like I did my job. I feel like I did it very well. If, if you hear it for the first time and it's hitting you here, because of what what I did is is right. Um, I don't care about how sonically great it is or isn't. It's all about how it's going to emotionally impact the listener. So for me, it's a very uh, very wide palette of what is good. And it's all about it's all per song, all per song. How to make your mix sound great on the professional speakers and cheap headphones? Well, that's a, that's a that's a great point. I. I for me, it, I use multiple sets of speakers, um, like in my own uh, here or in my own personal mix room. You'll see I always have NS10s for a more uh, mid-range focused, uh, you know, sound that doesn't have a pretty top end like the Genelex or the Atoms do. Um, plus, it don't have a big punchy bottom end, so I can hear all that overlapping mid-range. You know, where all those vocals and guitars and everything else are fighting for real estate, you know, because there's not, there's only so much space in that frequency range available. And so I can hear it really, really exposed. So then I can EQ to match a lot of speakers in my own personal studio. I even have a set of Auratones, if you remember those, and they're very, very small cubes about that big. And, um, they're right beside each other and they're off side in the, to the side kind of in mono. And, um, so I'm hearing how loud, um, stereo information is so if the listener is out of the sweet spot or if they're listening on like the the amazon echoes and the various little speakers that we have now around our homes that are bluetooth um they're kind of stereo but they're kind of not so i use my little aratones as a reference to what it would sound like on those uh without all the stereo information and lastly if you know it's going to be heard on speakers that don't have a lot of bottom in i think it's important to make sure that our bass drums and our bass guitar have information that's up in the audible range. It can't be just all low end. You see, sometimes you can use distortion, for example, um, distortion to overdrive the frequency, the upper frequency ranges of it that get it up to where it's it's cutting through a mix, even on these little speakers that really aren't capable of playing back sixty hertz or eighty hertz or, or you know something like that. Um, so distortion makes that note more apparent that there is a bottom end there. Um, so that's kind of my trick is, is multiple sets of speakers and distortion and harmonics, you know, in the audible range on frequency on instruments that are otherwise, you know, um, too low frequency for certain speakers to even generate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for such a wonderful conversation. It's a huge honor talking to you. And thank you so much for being on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much. You're very you're very welcome, Alexi. Take care.